How small can you make machinery? Okay, that's the subject. And the, because I've heard people around in the bath saying, tiny machines. What is he talking about, tiny machines? And I say to him, you know, it's very small machines, and it doesn't work. I am talking about <laughs> very small machines, okay? <laughs> now, but before I start on machines, I'd like to talk about very small writing first. Okay, how small can we make writing? Or say, numbers. How big does a number have to be? If you want to write numbers down, what's the smallest you could possibly make them? I don't mean how high, if you're very delicate with your finger, how small you can make them, but with special machinery and so on, what is the ultimate limit? Well, the ultimate limit is that you can make a number. Of course, the number is just as good if you write it bigger or smaller. You say any size, any size. But you can't make it smaller than atoms. You can't write on an atom. You can't mark the atom number one. Because marks, you see, are just more atoms spread over other atoms, black atoms on top of white ones or whatever. So the way that you have to do to write something would be, let's say, to have a little patch of gold followed by a little patch of silver by another silver by a gold and so on, and some sort of code like dots and dashes to represent numbers. And uh, you could say that the smallest we could go would be, say, perhaps 100 atoms. Probably can go down to one atom, but if you want to make it nice, 100 atoms on a side. And I'd like to talk about how small that really is, because you don't quite appreciate how much you could write if you could write that way. So I start out further back and talk about uh, uh, things that have done in the past. People have pointed out to me that the Lord's Prayer has been written on the head of a pin. All right, now let's see what we would have to do if we wanted to write the entire Encyclopedia Britannica on the head of a pin. Can we do that? Well, first of all, the Encyclopedia Britannica has something 20, 30, some odd thousand pages. And you imagine that each page is on a special piece of paper and you put them all over the ground and you get a great big area, you know, 20,000 square feet. And that has to be shrunk down to the size of a head of a pin. And after a little figuring, you'll figure it out yourself. It's about 20,000 times reduced. So if we could reduce the size of the words, the letters, the dots in the pictures, the whole thing, everything that's in the encyclopedia, only by 20,000 times this way, and of course this way too, so it's 40 million times difference in area. There's a lot of difference in area between the head of a pin and 20,000 square feet. Uh, then we could write the entire encyclopedia on the head of a pin. And as I will indicate soon, that's not too difficult. Mm. To give you some idea of the scale in which that, to which that corresponds, an entire library, like the Caltech Scientific Library, can all be put on one library card. We could send all the information that's in the library on one library card, say to Brazil, if the library and scientific library in Brazil burns down out, and we just send them a one library card, which contains all the information in all the books in the Caltech Library. The Congressional Library of Washington is larger and requires something like Time Magazine to tell all that information at the scale. And so we see that if we could go down to 20,000 times smaller, and I'll show, tell you in a moment right away that that's nowhere near limits of atoms are not coming in at all at that scale, there's no problem in going 20,000 times, and that's the kind of scale that, that would be possible. So, just a moment while I look at my notes. If uh, we made it in the three-dimensional manner, you see, the, all that I've done so far is writing on the flat of the pin. I haven't used the guts of the head of the pin. The Encyclopedia Britannica actually uses a volume. It has page after page. 
If we could write deeper, you see, not just on the surface of the pin, but in the interior, we could ask ourselves, let's do it with our, with the atoms. That's much further reduced to get five atoms on a side, little cubes, that's a hundred atoms of gold and silver and so on. And now I'm not doing the pictures, but I'm just putting all the words in some call of code, like Morse code, with dots and dashes, it's gold and silver. How much could we put into what space? All right, now it turns out if you take all the books in all the libraries, Turkish, Hungarian, everything, all over the entire world, and just take the information, because I can't get the pictures at this scale, then all this goes into a volume of material one two hundredth of an inch on a side, which is the smallest piece of dust that you can possibly see. That's the net result of all mankind's arrangement of information. But all that information could be remembered in a piece of dust that size. And that gives us some idea about the fact that there's plenty of room to make things very much smaller than we ever made them before. Our books are obviously too big. What's the sense of having all that stuff in this big library when you can put it all in one card? Oh, it's convenient to have the books in your hand, but for some kind of a summary of all the information and to transmit the sub information from one place to the other, or send it, or suppose that you're afraid that all of civilization is going to collapse, and you would like to leave copies of the libraries, because you say everything in the Alexandria library was in one library, and that got smoked out, and that was the end of that knowledge. It would be guide. Good. Hurry up, we should make copies, okay? So we have all this dust, you see, little pieces of dust that have all have copies of it all over, and they can't get rid of all the dust, you see. Anyway, that's what it amounts to. Now you might ask, if we had something that small, now you, the five atoms on a side is a little, well, you could still read that, yeah, but let's go back to the 20,000 times reduced encyclopedia, which isn't as small as you can get, but pretty dramatic and good enough, right? How can you read it? Well, if you try an ordinary microscope to look at it, you can't see, you can't magnify more than 2,000 times because light has a structure and you can't see any closer than the structure called the wavelength of light. But you can use electron microscopes, which don't stop at 2,000, go up to 200,000. Well, we only need 20,000. It's only 10 times better than light. It's rather easy, actually, to see 20,000 times uh, reduced pictures with an electron microscope. It would be very easy to read this book that we wrote on the head of the pin, or this encyclopedia, with an electron microscope. The next question is, how would we write it? Well, it, it's possible to write it someday by using a kind of a thing like an electron microscope in reverse, in which to take the large-scale writing and use the lenses backwards to control a beam which is so far, which is very fine instead of running the microscope. You know, you can run a telescope backwards, you look through the wrong end, you've probably done this, and everything looks small. You can do the same with a microscope, and you can do that with an electron microscope. So you can make the pictures very tiny and imprint them easily, 20, not very easily. This turns out at the present time to be very difficult at the moment. That reverse electron microscope has not been developed very far, but I'm going to tell you what the situation is today. The first time I ever gave this part of the speech was 20 years ago. And you just said that someday, I'm surprised we haven't done it yet, and someday it'll be done. Now I can show that it can be done. But before I do that, I would like to talk about what we are now actually doing commercially in making things. How small do we make things? How delicately can we make them? Are we writing the Lord's Prayer on the head of a pin? No, we're not actually writing the Lord's Prayer on the head of a pin. We're doing a much smaller scale than that, but we're not writing the Lord's Prayer because in the meantime, uh, interests have changed somewhat. And uh, I'll show you on the first slide, if it's available, please, uh, something that you've all heard of, which is a computer chip, which is made... Uh, what happened to the slide? Oh, I see. Okay. This is only uh, 20,000 times reduced, and it's very difficult to see it because it's so fine. Is that we have? To, that's it. Good. And it has to be focused. It's really quite difficult to see that there's a very fine structure, and you can see some of the structure, but you can't quite see how fine it really is. This whole thing is about a, three millimeters across, and you've seen these things in magazines, and you say, well, it's just computers and so on. 
But from the point of view of humankind and its development, it's really quite an achievement to be able to manufacture something with such fineness of detail. The patterns look rather beautiful when they're worked out, and it does appear as an artistic thing too, but the beautiful thing about this is the delightfully accurate workmanship. We're always talking about workmanship, you don't do anything like we used to do, we used to polish things down. The accuracy which they polish things is less than one of these little notches in here. Now we can even make something in that much detail, and it's made and used as is an example of a computer chip. I'm sorry to bother you to put the lights back again, but it'll be a minute or two before I get to the next slide, okay? It's a kind of a complicated arrangement. Because I wanted to explain how such a thing is made. This is made, I, that was magnified about 20,000 times. We can make things at uh, 2,000 times, I mean. That was 2,000 times. 20,000 times is very much harder because 2,000 times we can use light. And the way it's done is to use a lens system, a microscope, backwards. What we do is uh, you take some material, in fact, in this particular case, it's silicon, and there's a layer of very beautifully made, very pure silicon. The reason is any piece of dirt or scratch or anything that's wrong with it is a great big monster boulder at this scale, and you don't want any dirt, so you get very pure silicon. And then, in a vacuum, you let in oxygen. And then what forms on the surface of this is a layer of the compound silicon dioxide, which is simply quartz or sand or, or like glass. It's a thin layer of glass, which is an insulator. Silicon is a conductor. So you, we're going to build this thing up. Now on top of this, the next layer, we put on some, uh, oh, I got lots of colors, that's great. Another chemical which is called, is evaporated on in the thin layer, which is called a photoresist. And then, light is shine, shown on here. Light comes down. Let's say like this, in a pattern. No light here, and only light here and here because it's an optical system. It's a picture. In other words, a picture is projected, black and white picture is shown on here. And what happens to the light, what the light does, is make this material resist etching later, or rather dissolving it off, excuse me. So it gets to be resistant here, where the light's shown. I've got a simple pattern, but you might have a little section in here and so forth. So you can make the shapes that you want by using the light backwards to make this thing so that it doesn't dissolve. And then what happens, you dissolve this material away, Right? And just have these. Then you attack the silicon dioxide, the glass, with hydrofluoric acid, which dissolves glass. And this part is erased so that this disappears. I won't, let's say the silicon dioxide is white and, oh, oh, brown, brown. So, brown. And so we get things like this, you see little columns of brown on top of the silicon, right? And then the red stuff that I showed there was dissolved by another chemical because it was only a tool and a scaffolding, and so we get to this picture. Remember that these are insulators, and this is a conductor. So the next step is to shine some, is to evaporate some silicon again.